b-boy from the old to the new still a b-boy too bold for the school still a b-boy east coast to the west b-boys worldwide we supposed to be blessed still a b-boy this week we're heading one state over to michigan but not motown we're going a few miles north to flint to talk to an mc dj and producer who's been putting it down for years b-boys b-girls give it up for gaza how you doing man Pretty good. Good to be here, brother. So what are your, some of your first memories of hearing hip-hop? My first memories go way back to the 80s. Uh, I had an older brother, about five years older than me, named Ryan. And uh, he basically was exposed to a, a lot of great hip-hop music through like his classmates and the radio. And he brought everything to me, and I just fell in love with it in like the early 80s, man. just He showed me this radio show out of Saginaw, Michigan called The Boogie. And uh, the DJ just played the dopest hip hop music I'd ever heard. It just totally was a, it blew my mind and changed my life, this music. And uh, I just wanted to seek it out after that, you know, go out there and find, uh, you know, artists, buy their albums, you know what I'm saying? Try to see a concert. And uh, basically my brother, you know, having him be a little older than me was a big advantage to me. So even as a young kid, I was exposed to like, you know, Public Enemy, NWA, Beasties, Run DMC, all the great stuff. He brought it all to me. I remember even uh, one of his friends, uh, Eddie Maldonado, coming over to our house and he was a break dancer. It was my first time ever seeing a B-boy, you know, live in person. And that right there made a big, big impression on me and maybe fall even more in love with hip hop music. So when you start getting into it, who are some of your first favorite MCs? Who were your favorites? Some of my first favorite MCs would definitely be the Beastie Boys, uh, LL Cool J, Cool Mo D, um, Kid Sensation was a big inspiration yeah. to me growing up. I really liked yeah. him a lot. Uh, of course, like Chuck D from Public Enemy, that voice, you know, made a big impression on me. Just so powerful. And then uh, Cats, when I heard, uh, you know, KRS One. And of course, one of my biggest inspirations was Rakim when I heard Microphone Fiend as a young kid. That was like another game changer for me, man. That guy just was so much more complex and just doper lyrically than everybody it just blew my mind. Those those cats were definitely all the ones that definitely put me on the right path. Yeah, and you mentioned artists like, first one I want to touch on is Kumo D does not get brought up enough. No. He was so ahead of his time. Yes. I mean, he was an amazing MC from the beginning. He needs to be remembered more fondly. I agree, man. He was a dope, you know, a pioneer. No and doubt. You don't get enough credit, man, for the styles and skills that he mm -hmm. brought to the table. And, you know, artists like Chuck D and Karis one they taught me more about history than my teachers did. Right. I'm only half joking. I mean, it, it's true. It's true. Right. So at what age do you think maybe I can do this? When did you first start writing or rapping? I actually have proof of my very first uh, lyrics I ever wrote. In 1987, I had a... Uh, uh, assignment from school to uh, do a poem or write something for my mom and I ended up writing a rap for my mom in 87 I was 11 years old and that pretty much you know set me on the path right there uh I you know I just loved hip-hop music so much and it just really you know spoke to me and it, I just automatically I wanted to be a b-boy I wanted to write graffiti I wanted to be a rapper all that stuff I wanted to get on the radio be a dj it just, I don't know, it was, it was the first type of music that really spoke to me and it touched my soul and made me feel like I could be a part of this. I want to be a part of this. You still have the actual yeah, rap you wrote? Yeah, my that, mom's got it framed. That is so <laughs> dope that you still have that. Yeah, the mom rap. Because <laughs> I can remember, like, my first real rap I wrote was for the 1990 Super Bowl with the Bills and the Giants. But I don't have it. I would love to have it. I know it was like a, a pro Buffalo Bills, and they obviously lost. So at what point do you think start to put songs together? You know, like one thing I'm really noticing with this show is I did it independently, but so many people of our era, we were just at home. They call them pause tapes now. I didn't have a name for them, but when you're right. just playing a beat through one boombox into the other boombox speaker, you know, yeah. I, w I was just coming up with it. And there's a lot of us who started that way. When did you get to the point where you're starting to structure songs together? I'd say where I first started taking it seriously, I would say probably about 91, uh, definitely early 90s. That's when I first started actually writing songs with hooks 
And uh, I didn't have a producer at first. I basically kind of did, you know, what they do nowadays where you take a beat from another artist. But uh, I never wanted, like, the hit song and make a mock version of it. I wanted to go after, like, the B-side remix, something that was going to fool the people and let them think it was my beat. So I'd write, you know, I'd write to those kind of beats, the the B-side of Nice and Smooth, uh, Sometimes I Rhyme Slow or something like that, you know, the mm-hmm. remix of that. And uh, we had a lot of success doing that. And basically, we just record on a karaoke machine, a little two-track, play the beat on one, and then nail the entire rap song, hooks included, all on one take. <laughs> <laughs> you had it. You had to do one take. You had to do one take. There was no editing. There was no editing. I know. It's crazy yeah. to think about. So talk about when did you start the group Artful Dodgers? Artful Dodgers basically had its original uh, start. I would say in about 1993, uh, we had a group called B-Guys and the DLP. Originally, it was me, DJ Fish, and I kind of had a hype guy named Dynamite D. Uh, shortly after that, we found this other local rapper named Too Young, a real dope cat, golden voice. We ended up, you know, I had to have him part of, be part of the group. As soon as we met him, we knew he was skilled. So we got him in the group. Then we became just the DLP. Shortly after that, we joined up with another group from the Flint area called Triple Chaos, and we were the DLP, the Download Profits. They were Triple Chaos. We came, we became the Chaotic Profits. Did some music, did some demos, some shows under Chaotic Profits. But soon after that, we became the Juggernaut in uh, 1995. And uh, the Juggernaut released a single, uh, Act Like You Know, it was real successful for us. We did like little touring and stuff. But in 96, the group disbanded. I wanted to keep doing music. I almost started doing solo stuff then. But uh, I wanted to include my partner, Too Young, and who at that time, he had changed his name to Jackpot, and we became Art for Dodgers as a duo in uh, 1997. That's when we released our first project, the Dust of Real EP, with a uh, local Flint DJ producer, uh, Physics. So in 97 is when AD really took off. And one thing I want to bring up, moving, I'm bouncing ahead a little bit here, but you come from the era where you're, you have to physically hand someone a copy of your music pre-internet, pre-streaming. Yeah. Uh, kind of talk about, you know, the younger generation have no clue what it's like to just hit the streets with flyers and handing out tapes and, and CDs. So true, now, man. You, You've been in both now. You know, yeah. just kind of talk about, is your heart fonder of what you came up or is it nice now that you can sit in one room and get your music out? Yeah, a little bit of both. Uh, definitely, I, I, you know, I definitely feel that because I was out there hand billing cars, passing out flyers, and I'm really proud of the fact that pre-internet in the 90s, we were packing venues just from word of mouth and flyers. You know what I'm saying? I think if we would have had the addition of the internet at that time, it would have been crazy. You know what I mean? Because we were already promoting really hard and getting a good response. And uh, I'm really proud of that fact. You know what I mean? It was just basically all just hard work, getting out there. We did crazy stuff. Like we would go into other schools without permission and hang up flyers on the lockers and stuff. And so I can't believe we did that. I mean, we probably could have got arrested or something. You know what right. I mean? But we did it. We were just so hype and wanted to share our music and promote our shows. And so we got out there and did that. And it was also nice, uh, you know, selling the hard copies in that day when they're, you know, before streaming people had to have a hard copy of your stuff. So they would seek it out. And I remember like selling out the local record store in Flint, Wide Earth. We'd sold that out of our Juggernaut cassette single. We sold it out of our Dust of World EP. And it was just a great feeling going back in there and they would reorder more and, uh, you know, all that before streaming. I mean, you had a little bit of people dubbing tapes. I guess that's kind of a little similar. But uh, I definitely do like the new era in that you can get the music to everybody everywhere very conveniently. You know what I'm saying? I do appreciate that. Um, The only downside of that is I feel like the whole market and the scene is kind of flooded now with everybody having that access with the computer recording. And then anybody can basically distribute their music on all the platforms. So, you know, it's it's getting a little crowded, but I think the dope artists are still going to shine through in the long run. Yeah, you can wake up one morning and say, I'm going to be a rapper. And then later that day, the whole yeah. world can have access to it. It's crazy, yeah, right? Yeah, so true. And it's right. like we would spend so much money going to recording studios back oh, then. Yeah. It's crazy. I know. It's we crazy. spend hundreds just to get the beat done. I talk about when did you start Earth Movers Records? Uh, basically, Earth Movers originally started as a different label called Midwestern Union. And that was kind of the label that Arthur Dodgers released all their stuff under. And then right about uh, 2010, when I decided to go solo, work on Arthur Dodgers disbanded. That's when I changed Midwestern Union to Earth Movers Records, just basically because uh, 
I wanted something that was my own idea into something new and fresh and kind of get away from the Midwestern Union, you know what I'm saying, label. So that was kind of in the past. I wanted Earth Movers to be something new. So around 2010, that's when I launched that and uh, basically started doing everything myself, started doing the beats myself, distributing, d- designing, all that stuff, you know what I'm saying? You're in Flint, which pro- gets overshadowed by, you know, Detroit's just a little bit south of you. Sure. You ever find that that tough on the underground scene, kind of being overshadowed by Detroit, or was it nice to be that close to a you know underground mecca of hip hop? A little bit of both, because uh, you know we definitely uh, you know what I'm saying we got some great shows out of the Detroit scene early on, especially as Art for Dodgers, and I really I don't know I really don't know what happened in the years since then, but I felt more welcomed into the scene. I guess maybe because there's less rappers or something. We came from Flint to Detroit and they embraced us as soon as they saw that we had skills and we were taking it seriously and we were like, you know, lovers of the culture and supporters of the culture. People embraced us. We had a lot of great shows in uh, 2003. We even won uh, DetroitRap.com's album of the year with our second win album. If that tells you anything, we were the only Flint artist on the entire award show and we won album of the year, which was pretty incredible. It showed we had a lot of fans and a lot of supporters in the D at that time. And uh, it's weird, though, because... I noticed when we'd play outside of Michigan, a lot of times we would get, uh, you know, billed as Detroit artists for some reason. They kind of wouldn't know what Flint is. It's such a smaller city. And uh, they would just be like from Detroit or whatever. And I'm sure we might have caught flack from some people because from that. But it's like never anything that we wanted to do. We never claimed Detroit. We did have a DJ from Detroit at one point. So we did have affiliations. But we always, you know what I'm saying, knew we were from the smaller city and we were proud of that. And uh, especially with like, you know, cats like MC Breed putting on the entire Michigan and Midwest region even more than our Detroit counterparts. You know what I'm saying? You know, they had the awesome Dre and Eshan made a lot of noise. But Breed, man, with that single, he just blew the doors open for all of us. And, uh, you know, so after that, I was really proud to be from Flint seeing Breed, DFC, Dayton, all them. I, it's like, I wanted to be a part of that scene. I was proud of it. We always repped Flint and told people where we were from and corrected them if they, you know, thought we were from Detroit. I mean, what a legend, yeah. MC Breed. That, oh, that first record, so dope, so dope. Incredible, I man, what a voice and delivery. <laughs> Amazing. Out of all the artists you've got to collaborate with, who was some of your one or two favorites that you got to make songs with? Some of my favorites would definitely be uh, the Dayton family. Uh, my latest album, Black Vinyl, I did a song called Flint Titans. And I actually had uh, Shoestring and Bootleg come over to my studio. And these guys were just professionals, man. They just, they came prepared, laid their stuff down, an incredible energy. They even had a new way of recording I hadn't seen before, which was really dope to me and kind of inspired me to kind of follow suit on that track. And uh, they really dope, man. Big shouts out to them cats. Just a great energy. Another artist that I was real uh, hyped to work with in the studio was my man Juice uh, from Chicago. We uh, did a couple songs, it's Arthur Dodgers with him, man, and it's another cat just had a great energy and like, you know, I'm surprised he didn't do more. I mean, he's, he gets a lot of play for like destroying MC in uh, the MC battles and stuff, mm-hmm. but what a dope recording artist and what a good voice and delivery on him, you know, really great working with him. And uh, another group that I really enjoy working with was Project Born from Flint. These guys are like family. Uh, they actually use my recording studio to record at times. I've done some beats for them, but they basically been coming over here since uh, I think their Born Supremacy album, you know, a few years back. And uh, we've done, I think maybe four or five, maybe six songs together, man. Every one of them dope. And uh, definitely my favorite collab with them is my latest one, Totally Insane. We did a real good video for it and stuff. And uh, they really brought it in that one, man. Them guys are definitely legends. People always talk about Eshan, Dayton family. I mean, to me, Project Born's right in there. You know what I mean? They don't get mentioned enough. Definitely some uh, unsung uh, dope cats from Flint. A big shout out to Project Born. And yeah. they're, they're mad cool as people. Yeah. You know, you know I've had them on the show. Just cool. mad cool, mad cool. Yeah, good guys. Really good. Gaza Strip Radio Show. How did that come about? Uh, basically, in 2005, when Arthur Dodgers was still going strong, there was like a local radio station, 93.7 out of Flint, and they were playing a lot of hip hop and we wanted to get our music on there so bad. We were calling all the time. We had all of our fans call up there requesting our music and they would never would play our music. 
the the best way they would do is they give us like shout outs, shout out to our for Dodgers. You know, that's the best they do. They wouldn't never play our music, and uh, none of the local stations, none of the local mainstream stations would play our music. And at this point, I start DJing a little bit at some local clubs, and uh, I met a local promoter, and he was going to the Kettering University radio station to do some promotions, and he invited me along to go to uh, the station meeting or whatever. I went down there and I had these ideas of, uh, you know, coming from the frustration of these mainstream stations not playing us or any local Michigan. I mean, they wouldn't even play Breed or Dayton Family. That's crazy, these stations yeah. wouldn't even play No Future regularly. It's crazy. You know, they wouldn't play right. Flint Town in Flint Town. It's messed up. <laughs> you know, I don't, I don't understand it. But uh, in 2005, I went to this meeting. I gave them ideas about, uh, you know, doing a local show playing only Michigan music. Only Michigan, you know what I'm saying? I, not just a little bit, only Michigan. And they love the idea of, you know, getting the local community involved. And uh, they, you know, at that point, they offered me my slot to do a radio show. And it just hit the, you know, I hit the air we, airwaves and was blowing up from there, man. Just, I got a lot of love from playing artists like Project Born, Dayton Family, Esham, you know, all these cats that have never been playing on Flint Radio. All of a sudden, I was getting them in every week. I used to do the show twice a week on Mondays and Tuesdays, and I would just play all these artists I loved and all these talented cats from Michigan, man, and people really embraced it and fell in love with it. I mean, I would have, I'd go on vacation, and I'd have people, like, begging me to come back and do the show, and I got a lot of regular listeners, and uh, through the radio show, I ended up being on the MC Breed documentary. I don't know if you get, got a chance to see that. Uh, it was put together a couple years ago. No, I and, haven't. I, I yeah, can seek that out, yeah. Yeah, it's actually called uh, Breed and Bootleg, uh, Legends of Flint Rap. And I do an MC Breed uh, day every year uh, commemorating his death. And I play two hours of only Breed's music. And through that, his family and everything caught wind of me. And they invited me to become part of the documentary. That was really cool, man. And that's just me. I want to keep the legends in the spotlight. You know, these guys meant a lot to me. I'm not going to let their music just disappear not during my watch, you know what I mean? I'm going right. to keep playing this music. I'm going to let everybody know the stuff that inspired me and the classic hip-hop to me deserves to be in a spotlight. I don't get it why these classic rock stations, they'll keep the same rock groups going forever, ACDC, mm -hmm. Metallica, you know, whatever. Hip-hop stations, nah. You put out music in the 90s, they're like, you're gone, you know what I mean? But not to me, man. I'm going to keep playing that music, and I'm going to do my best, and I hope other people, I mean, cats like you are doing a similar thing, man. I love that you, uh, you know, support the real hip-hop and the pioneers, you know what I'm saying? I got mad love for you, man. Uh, keep keep it up. You know, it's what I grew up on, yeah, I, similar to you. They, we need to keep their names alive, because if yeah. it wasn't for them, these new kids who are mumble rapping and making a lot of money... You know, Cool Herc wasn't cashing big checks. And, you know, Kumo D, not even. You know, oh. I, I interviewed Spice One, and for nice. 187, he wrote, which won gold, he made a profit of $30,000. Now, you would think Spice One was making a bunch of money, right? I know. I mean, these, they were, these people we grew up on were not getting paid, and it, it's terrible. Yeah. But at least the current generation is, is a little bit better in that, that regard. That's true. They're handling their business a little better, it seems. You know, right. Sure. Talk about your new album, Black Vinyl. I, not just because you're on the show, I really like it. I think it's a perfect, I could tell right away you were an old school hip hop head like me. I mean, the production, each, I think every song has, you know, dope scratching, which is something that's missing so much from current day hip hop. Yes. I don't know what happened to the DJ. You know, talk about putting that project together. Yeah, basically uh, right around the time of the pandemic, uh, me and my uh, friend DJ Virus were, uh, you know, starting to do some work together. And I had this idea of doing an album kind of based on my sampling style of sampling old records and my love of DJ scratching, man. And I agree with you. What the hell happened? Why Why did new hip hop cats don't even, they don't even think about it. No. They're like, huh, scratching, huh? What's that? You know, to me, that's a crucial element of hip hop music. You know what I'm saying? The scratching is super important. It was just, I don't know, man. It was just, it brought so much character to it when I first heard hip hop back in the days, hearing the DJs cutting it up on it. So much dope energy. And, you know, I just really loved it. 
And uh, so I basically wanted to make an album that kind of spoke to the fans of that and to the culture of vinyl addicts and producers that are getting their fingers dusty. You know what I'm saying? The cats that really appreciated that, you know, style of hip hop music of taking something old and obscure and dusty, cleaning it off, taking it out of context and making something new and dope out of it. You know what I'm saying? And that's what black vinyl was all about. I did all the beats myself. I got a DJ scratching on every single song. That was my mission. You know what I mean? Normally, I'll have DJing, you know, on a majority of my songs, but never all of them before. And with this time, it was my mission. And uh, that's a big thanks to DJ Virus. This guy came over for a couple, like, huge scratch-a-thon recording sessions, and he just killed it, man. He brought so many different styles and techniques and just really good skills of cutting. Uh, so he did, like, I think, uh, nine of the tracks on the album that, that Virus did. And uh, he just killed it, man. So big shots out to him. And then my man DJ Cycle did a couple of tracks. My boy DJ Zach Carter from Detroit, he did a couple of tracks too. And uh, so I really wanted the element of the DJ to be, you know, right in the center of this project because I'm so fed up with the mainstream cats not including hip hop. I mean, uh, scratching into hip hop anymore. And my theory on that is because these rappers are just so fucking greedy. You know what I mean? They don't want to share the money with the right. DJs anymore. So they're not going to pay another guy to get there to, just to do some scratching. Some of them probably even have pre-recorded scratching, which is very sad. Oh, I'm sure. I'm sure. You know yeah. I mean? That's probably terrible. Right. But, uh, you know, you hear about even like EPMD having a falling out with DJ Scratch over money and stuff, which is pretty sad. And then cats like uh, Salt and Pepper, I think had a falling out with Spinderella mm -hmm. at one point. And it's like, keep the DJ in there. I always had love for groups like Run DMC because they really made you feel like Jam Master J was a part of the group. He just wasn't a backup guy. He right. was in the group, just like how Dilated Peoples was with Babu. They are like, this guy is in the group. He's crucial to the, you know, to the group and the whole sounds that we got going. And uh, I got nothing but love for that. And uh, with this album, I also wanted to really uh, bring some of my best collabos. That's why I sought out the Dayton family. I actually got to know them through the uh, MC Breed documentary, and I really hit it off with them. Really great guys. And so we did our collab with Flint Titans, which is basically kind of like a song, a tribute to the Flint area, a city that I love, a music scene that I love. And then, of course, I got Project Born on the album with Totally Insane, really great track. Um, other collabos, I got a Posse Cut, Deep Star uh, 6 with some dope MCs, Philosophy Cole, Ill Tone, Josie Wales, Aslan My D, Cyrus Grism. And uh, I even got some like, live instrumentation on the album. My man Sean Humphrey played some live bass. My man Justin Slattery played some uh, keys and some synth. And uh, I'm really proud of this album. I took my time with it. I worked on it for about two years. Got everything right. I had my man Farlon Randall, a.k.a. Bangtown. He did all the mixing and the mastering. Did a great job. This guy's a Flint legend, too, going back to a group called Faux Deep back in the day. They did a lot of stuff with, like, Ready for the World. He's, he's a real dope cat. And uh, so he did all the mixing and the mastering. And then uh, shout out to my man Mike Case. He helped me out with the album cover. And basically, on the album cover, you get a shot of my uh, recording studio, my uh, little, like, record room. I got records all, you can kind of see it a little bit here behind me, mm -hmm. uh, but I got, you know, album covers lining the entire album or the whole whole wall back there and uh, black vinyl. That's what, it, you know, I want every rap I know pressed up on black vinyl. No, I, I love it. It's what hip hop needs, you know. Anyone Thanks watching, lot, if, if you're an old school hip hop head, check it out, like for real. One thing I like to ask everyone I interview is, do you have one or two crazy show memories? Something bananas that just happened at a show. Oh, yeah. I got a couple of different crazy <laughs> ones. Uh, early on as Arthur Dodgers, we did this uh, talent show in Flint called The Super Show. I think this was 1997. Uh, we were the only white guys on this entire show. So we're backstage and everyone's telling us that we're going to get booed. They're like straight out telling us they're going to boo you. So just keep performing. Don't let the booing stop you. We go out to the, you know, we're so nervous. We're drinking like gallons of water backstage, just even before I really smoked or drank. So I'm just like drinking water, super nervous. We go, it's at the IMA, IMA Sports Arena. Now it's called the Dort Federal Event Center or something. Big venue in Flint, real nice spot. We go out there, there's like 3,000 people in the crowd. We did our thing and they loved us, man. Nobody booed. They cheered so hard. It was just amazing. 
And that right there, I took as an omen, man. We won over that large crowd when everybody backstage was so sure that they were going to, like, reject us. And uh, that was great, man. That, that really meant a lot to me. And uh, another really memorable show is Artful Dodgers. Is uh, We did a show with Too Short at this place called Bugsy's. And uh, we were waiting for our DJ to come. And uh, so we were a little late. One of the opening acts went. And then DJ Assault, I'm not sure if you know him. Uh, he's kind of a well-known DJ. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so DJ Assault was going on too, and I guess it was in the contract that Too Short must go on directly after DJ Assault. So anyway, the opener act goes, we're waiting for our DJ to show up, he's running late, and then DJ Assault goes on all of a sudden. Next thing you know, Too Short goes on after him, they totally, you know, skipped our slot. The show went great for Too Short or whatever, so we go on after Too Short. And, I mean, we only got to do a couple songs before the venue closed and the lights came up, but it went good. The sound system was good and everything. And uh, now we can always tell people, Too Short opened up for us. <laughs> yeah, that's a great story. Great story. <laughs> I'm going to name an MC or a group and just tell me the first thing that comes to mind. First one on my list is MC Breed. MC Breed, I think legend. I think uh, pioneer, the guy that paved the way for all of us. A guy that took... Uh, you know what I'm saying? A little bit of the East Coast, a little bit of the West Coast. He mixed it up, man, throwing a little of that Motown flavor and just, he killed it, man. He just almost reinvented the wheel in a way with that sound and bringing the G-Funk and, uh, you know, just a legend, man. Big shouts, big shouts out to MCB. Rest in peace. No doubt. How, how about Ice-T? Ice-T, another legend. That's a cat that I forgot to mention earlier as one of my favorite early MCs. I mean, when uh, I heard that song, Colors, it just, you know what I'm saying, really spoke to me. I loved it, man. And then uh, when I saw the movie New Jack City, and I actually, I went, I was on a trip to Arizona to see my grandparents, and I went, uh, my parents, my grandparents went to go see some other movie. I wanted to see New Jack City. I went to this theater alone. There was nobody else in there, man, as a young teenager, and I watched New Jack City, and just hearing that OG soundtrack bumping new jack hustler oh man i just i became more and more of a fan of ice t and early on he was definitely one of my favorite mcs man and uh, also one of the better actor turn rappers i would say too man i really liked his role in new jack city and he plays a great cop surprisingly for a guy that does cop killer right right <laughs> no absolute legend yes. we're going back to flint with project born i know we kind of touched on it before yeah project born that's family right there man these are just some cool cats I met them like in the early 90s when they did a show in Flint at the network. Uh, they opened up for Isham, Nadis, and ICP. And uh, I remember them leaving. They were like driving in like a Cadillac or something, man. And I got a glossy photo from Nadis. And I actually had Project Born sign the back of this Nadis glossy. And that was my first time meeting these cats, man. And because we were all big fans of them from their song, uh, Losing It. They right. released what that single, Sean? man. And that's I had that tape. I had oh, that man, tape. That's yeah. a classic. Yeah. That's really sought after now, too, man. It's really hard yeah. to find. Yeah, it's I still got my original one. Yeah. Dope, dope. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, people went crazy for that single, man. And that's when Eshan was kind of at the height of his powers, too. So having yeah. him on the remix was just, like, wild. And, uh, you know, when I hear Project Born, I think Legends, too, man. They held it down for Flint. And they didn't try to sound like Bree. They didn't try to sound like Dayton Family. They had their own style, man. And kind of bringing that little bit of the street, but a little bit of horrorcore vibe. Mm -hmm. And just real dope, man. Big shouts out to Frank Nitty, Pope D, and a rest in peace to Half Pint. You know, nothing but love for them guys. How about Scarface of the Ghetto Boys? Another dope MC, man. I really like Scarface. He's my favorite member of the Ghetto Boys. Uh, I really like a lot of his solo work, too. But just what a voice, man. I feel like he was a huge inspiration in the Flint area. Um, not so much these cats we've been talking about, but there's a lot of MCs from the Flint area that I think Ghetto Boys were a huge influence on, and they kind of have a similar flow and voice to Scarface. And uh, what a great storyteller, dope MC, wow. man. I mean, he's just incredible. I hope that I can see him live one of these days. I keep hearing about him possibly retiring or something. That really sucks. And, uh, you know, I definitely wish I could have saw Ghetto Boys and you know, a rest in peace Bushwick. Yeah. Uh, they were just a dope crew, man. Made a lot of incredible music. I got a Ghetto Boys mind playing tricks on me vinyl on the wall, so... I'm a, Scarface is always looking at me, you know what I'm saying? Uh, how about the Wu-Tang Clan? Oh, yeah. I love the Wu-Tang, man. This is an incredible group. They really are being big inspiration on me, and I've had a lot of cats see tell me that I have a little bit of a Wu uh, influence in my music because I like the grimy beats. I like, you know, lyricism, razor-sharp punchlines, and, 
you know, that's definitely my style too. And uh, I love the woo, man. Inspector Deck, Method Man, Jizza. I've seen them in concert, I think three or four times, man. And they always brought it really yeah. dope. I saw them at Movement in Detroit and uh, it was incredible, man. The way they were backing up each other at that show was just like the way you want Wu-Tang to sound. You know what I mean? They were just so on point, hitting all the, the rhyme words, backing each other up. And it was just amazing. Uh, you mentioned him a few times. What about Isham? He's dope, man. I like Isham a lot. Uh, another big inspiration to me coming up, man. I just, you know, you can't knock his hustle. He was an independent artist with no commercial reach at all. And he made so much noise in Michigan, man. You would swear he was, was as big as L O Cool J mm -hmm. or Ice Cube or some of these guys. Because in the Michigan area, man, he would pack venues. He would sell out tapes, sell out CDs. Real dope artist. Uh, uh, we did a show with him at the Metropolis in Flint in 1999. And uh, it was really cool opening up for him. Uh, you know, it was a great show for us. and was really good for us. And so I meet Ishan backstage. And I'm expecting this guy to be this kind of like weirdo, right. devil worshiping, crazy guy. And he was so normal and friendly, man. He, was, he smoked a blunt with us. We used to have a band with Arvo Dodgers. We had a female bass player, and Ishan actually was like hitting on our bass player. He was like so normal and cool, like you know. So big shots out to Ishan. He's a dope MC too, man, and uh, I got respect for him, no doubt. What about Easy E? Easy E, man, yeah, another dope cat that uh, had a big inspiration to me as a kid. I loved NWA, and uh, when I heard like Panic Zone and Boys in the Hood. Those songs really just, you know, made me light up, man. The energy and the, the dope sounds, man. The Dr. Dre production with the Easy e voice, man, was just magical. They never were able to achieve that magic again, man, with Dre's production and his voice and Cube's writing, man, was just, like, legendary. It was, like, the perfect storm of hip-hop dopeness. And, uh, and, you know, Easy e went on to do a lot of great things, putting on cats like Bone Thugs and Blood of Abraham and... You know, he did a lot of dope things, man. So a big shout out to Easy. I like him a lot too. What about Dice? Dice from uh, Motown, man. Dope yeah. cat. Another good friend of mine. We've done a lot of shows together. I've done a couple songs with them uh, on my uh, Scorpion Dragon '76 album. Did a called song called "Rap Bastard," and I got Dice and Project Born on it, which was uh, you know a big achievement for me getting Project Born and Dice. So first time them guys ever did a song together. So. A little bit of history there, yeah, you know yeah. what I mean? They should have done something together because they're kind of from similar yeah. circles, but they never had, and I was the man to make it happen, man. They both brought it. Real dope cat, man. He's just great energy live. I've seen him perform a lot of times. When he does What It Be Like, woo, the crowd would just go crazy, man. Like, And he's another cat like Isha, man. In the 90s, he was as big as anybody. He was, you know, selling out venues, he was one of the first Detroit artists, like, signed to a label. I remember he had, like, a real professional video. Like, Dice really did it, man. He did a lot of good work. His first album, 40 Ounce, made me do yeah. it. Great album. And, of course, The Neighborhood Shit Talker. That's, like, his masterpiece. Classic, yeah. You can listen to that album all the way through, you know. So, yeah, big shots out to Dice. That's my guy right there. What about Eminem? Eminem, he's dope, man. Um, we actually have a little bit of a connection with Eminem because uh, we actually – we're signed to a label early on, uh, Silent Records out of Detroit, ran by a cat named Mark Kemp. And uh, prior to Silent Records, he ran Federation Records, which did a lot of stuff with Eminem's camp. They put out like a bizarre album featuring Eminem and Fuzz Scuda and Outsiders. They put out, uh, you know, a lot of uh, different projects, uh, the, uh, the Ruckus featuring Eminem. And uh, I've always thought he was a dope cat. Mark Kemp's actually the first person that played it for me. Before, way before Eminem blew up, I would say about 97 is when I first heard the uh, Slim Shady EP that Mark helped release. And we were just, me and all my friends were blown away by his lyricism. You know, like what a great voice, delivery, great lyrics, a multi syllable flow. Like you couldn't deny the talent. And uh, he's just a, he's a dope MC, man. He's definitely paved the way for a lot of cats. And uh, my only beef with him, I said, I'm not crazy about his beat selection every time. I feel like with the access of producers he could have, he should have the greatest beats ever. I mean, why why couldn't Eminem have a album with Alchemist, Pete Rock, Dre, Primo? Primo. Yeah, he, damn, because yeah. he's got connections to like all them guys. You know, he he could, he could hook up with Primo through Royce of Five Nine, and they say Alchemist is his touring DJ, so it's like he could have this like great produced 
classic release. And at this point in his career, you know, he's had so much commercial success that I think he could do something like that without hurting anything. You know what I mean? Right. And, uh, but just like a top, top tier lyricist, man, especially yeah. on like a collabo. I feel like Eminem will outshine anybody. It's right. like he, he outshined Jay-Z on his track. I seen him do it on a lot of tracks. But uh, one of the only cats that didn't get outshined, I would say, is probably Buster Rhymes. The track they did together, Calm Down, I feel like Buster held his own with Eminem. But he's definitely one of the greatest, man, one of the greatest lyricists for sure. You can't deny it. The way he changes up his uh, cadence, delivery, the good lyrics. I mean, he's and he's good live too, man. I caught Eminem a couple times back in the day, opening up for Hieroglyphics opening up for uh, Razzcast in Detroit. And he was a humble, cool cat, man. He had dark hair then. Mm -hmm. He had, like, Bizarre and a couple cats backing him up. And, uh, you know, I knew he was going to make it somewhere, man. You, you couldn't deny the talent. And we'll end it with the Kings, Run DMC. Oh, yeah. One of the – definitely one of the biggest inspirations to me, man. When I first heard Run DMC, man, just blew my mind. Their energy was just so infectious and just undeniable. Like, these guys just had, like, the, the spirit of superheroes inside them just, you know, pumping out. And uh, I love Run DMC, man. And just they are kind of like the perfect hip-hop group to me with the DJ as an important part, laying scratches, you know, uh, juggling the breaks with two MCs, just both with different voices and deliveries, but both really energetic and powerful. They were just like the perfect group, you know what I mean? And uh, they're also huge to me because they brought us the Beastie Boys. You know there wouldn't be no Beastie Boys without Run DMC, man. It's just so evident in the Beastie Boys style that they were influenced mm -hmm. by Run DMC and, like, the early connections they had with, like, doing Paul Revere with them and, you know, Rick Rubin producing them both. And uh, so it's like they – Beasties are one of my favorite. They were, like, a huge inspiration to me. So Run DMC brought them, which was just, you know, amazing to me. And Run DMC has that longevity too, man. They had, they put out a lot of years of great music, you know, beats to the rhyme. The years later, after that's, their older stuff was, that's my favorite Run DMC song is beats man, to the rhyme. That song is so oh, dope. It holds up today. It holds yeah. up today. Yeah. That beat is just so dope, and the way the way they deliver it, and uh, I love that opening scene of their movie, Tougher Than Leather, where it's mm -hmm. just a performance of uh, of beats to the rhyme. Oh, so dope, man. Yeah, no doubt. Incredible. And even when they came back with Down with the King with their like crosses and their bald heads, they were still so dope. Yeah, man. that with Pete Rock and CL yeah, Smith. Yeah, man, I love that too, man. Yep. And uh, years later, uh, like when Rev Run came out solo and he kind of had like those throwback beats, man. He right. still had it. Like, man, they're just dope. I seen them in Flint at this place called the uh, uh, the Copa downtown Flint, real small venue, man, and just amazing performance. Just really left an impression on me and gave me so much inspiration, man. I love Run DMC. Uh, last year on the radio station, we did a tribute to them. Uh, we talked about Raising Hell and just what a great album. We talked about the singles and everything, man. And Just mad love for them. And I actually talked to DMC on the phone one time. My brother met him at the uh, St. Louis Comic Con. He was there uh, peddling his new comic book. And I guess it must have been slow for a minute or whatever. And he was like, here, call my brother. My brother just got married. And he's like, congratulate him. That's I got a call man. from DMC, man, congratulating me. And it was just amazing, man. It was really cool. Big shouts out to my brother for that one. You know, big shouts out for DMC. What a cool, humble cat, you know. Real, real cool, man. And rest in peace, Jam Master J, man. One of the best to ever do it. All right, that's what I got. You have anything to plug? Where can people find you on social media? Give it to them. Cool, cool. I'm on everything as Gaza or just Gaza. Uh, my website is bgaza.com, B-G-O-Z-Z-A.com. Got all my music on there. Got some free samples, all my information, all my music videos. Um, I'm planning on dropping a couple more music videos this summer in support of the Black Vinyl album, which is out now everywhere on all the streaming services and everything. And uh, you can get hard copies from me directly off the site. I'm also working on an instrumental album right now, which I'm planning on dropping this summer. Just some dope, soulful, boom bap beats, you know what I'm saying? My style with some nice cutting and stuff on there. Uh, so expect that this summer. I'm doing a project with my friend uh, Josie Wales, uh, Born Lethal, Back from the Labyrinth. Some real dope underground hip hop, some real, real nice lyricism, hard hitting beats. So that'll be dropping this summer. Um, I'm also working with this crew out of Flint called Rob Banks Organization. Been doing some shows with them, uh, doing a little DJing with them, and also performing my songs. I got an upcoming show in Flint, the uh, Alley Fest, this summer, uh, which is a pretty big deal. It's a pretty dope event. Anybody in the Michigan area, come out for Alley Fest. 
catch me and a bunch of other dope artists right in Buckham Alley in downtown Flint. They close off the alley and just put on a great show every year. And, uh, you know, I'm always working on stuff. And, uh, I, you know, mad props out to you, man. I definitely appreciate what you do. Keep holding it down for hip hop. You know what I'm saying? I got nothing but love for you. And, uh, you know, big shouts out to everybody out there, you know, supports me and all my listeners every week. Uh, you know, mad love to everybody, you know. Peace. I see, man. Peace. The record player. I'll just check it out. Do you have a record player at home? Playing records is good. You can have all of your own music. Get your favorite records. Hear different tunes. First, I'll turn the switch and see if it goes round and round. Whatever it takes, I want beats I create all the best speakers they make. I want the center of attention and the word that's fine. I want every rap I know pressed up on black vinyl. I want that big great man, whatever it takes. I want beats I create all the best speakers they make. I want the center of attention and the word that's fine. I want every rap I know pressed up on black vinyl. Far in the street, like my brainwaves stay. Waiting for the day that my pain goes away. I'm self-medicating, but I lost my way. Double cross, ripped off, lit off through styles gray. Watch what you say, like your vocab's visible. Words painted on a mural, surrounded by subliminal, sublime and difficult. Anti-coward music, my frame devoured. Take the power and reuse it. Can't contain or refrain from saying what I mean. Mean every word I under, not another routine. With a purpose intervene, still searching for steam. Motivation to overcome, obstacles between me and my goals. I rose to the occasion. Even farther, no starter, back up, I'm maintaining Never refrain, it feels like forever raining Yo, Man, whatever, I'm saving I want that big break, man, whatever it takes I want beats, I create all the best speakers they make I want the center of attention and a word that's final I want every rap I know pressed up on black vinyl I want that big break, man, whatever it takes I want beats, I create all the best speakers they make I want the center of attention and a word that's final I want every rap I know pressed up on black vinyl Like vinyl. 